Um, so, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I hate being recorded because <laughs> I just, I, I don't know what it is. Just something about being recorded just sort of sets me off. So I'll try and relax again. Um, uh, so well, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. I won't say I put on a clean shirt, but I did take off my bathrobe and put on a shirt. So I'm, I'm set. Well, I did notice that you put on, on an Aussie shirt, which is really... <laughs> did you do that I deliberately? That. That's I fantastic. That is the coolest thing ever. That is just brilliant. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, good. Thanks for noticing that. It's totally by accident. I've been wearing it for, for a couple of days. <laughs> That's brilliant. I I thought it was deliberate, but uh, even nope. by accident, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> too good, too good. Um, anyway, uh, so let me get started. Um, uh, actually, let me ask you this. How do you ref prefer to be uh, referenced? Do you like being called James or do you like Jim? Because I've known you from uh, through other people. They've always talked to, about you as Jim. But do you prefer that? Oh, do you prefer James? It's funny people are calling me Jim. Most people call me Cope. Yeah, that too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so C Cope probably works best. Only my mother calls me James. It's, uh... <laughs> so you prefer Cope? Yeah, Cope works good. Cool. Excellent. So, um, How about you? Everyone calls me Kane. Is it Kane or Kane or? No, Kane. Kane is the Hawaiian, Just... so yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I try to avoid that. Um, Just Kane. People just call me Cain. Cain, all right. Like Cain and Abel. That's... Right. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing terribly exciting. It's nice and simple, which is uh, a good thing. You know, it's sort of like one of those short, short names, which is always good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, tell me, how did you get into the Scrum community? What brought you into the Scrum community? Because... I'm guessing that you've got a really long history with Scrum in some way, but I don't know what yeah. that is. You know, it, it, it depends where you want to start. Um, it's kind of like, have you seen the, uh, what's the Steve Martin movie, where he starts, you know, saying, you know, I was born a poor black child. You know Steve <laughs> Martin? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, so, I don't let, know if we're going to go back that far. Let, let um, me see, the, let, me, but, uh, let me ask you yeah. this. Uh, one of the things that you're really well known for is the uh, the Borland article, the uh, the study about the Quattropro team in Borland. Um, so how about we start there? I think that was, what, 93, 94 time frame? Something like that. But if I could back up just a few years before that. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. I Please think it'll do. make the story a little more interesting. You know, why why was I doing that? Yeah, good point. Um, you know, I... You know, I I was at Bell Labs, and that's engineering heaven. Yep. And um, but actually, I mean, doing a little programming, but mainly doing program administration. Right. And I mean, it was technological hell, and we were rewarded for doing um, crazy innovative things on this Death March project. And uh, you know, I was very good at that, and was duly rewarded for it. And then I got into um, applied research or forward-looking work. Hmm. And started getting to know a guy new, named Moody Ahmad. And he started to give me this vision that, you know, that, that in, in addition to technology, there are these things out here called people. <laughs> you know, that people, people are really interesting and that the interesting problems are organizational problems. And it, uh, it all sounded kind of interesting and intriguing. And so I started looking at that. And that was, um, you know, that was probably the mid 1990s when I started looking at that, and then I, I got into Bell Labs research. Mm. You know, the um, the uh, the ivory tower, and at that time, um, there were some guys doing some work on visualizations. So there was a guy named Steve Ike, and he's pretty famous in the visualization community for for visualizing large data sets. I guess today we'd call it big data. Yep. And this was this was back in 1990, 1991, yep. and. It was maybe around 91 when I was invited by Kent Beck to go to this uh, meeting of seven guys on a mountaintop in Colorado. <laughs> to, uh, was it in Colorado? I can't remember now. But um, he had, Kent had been inspired by the work of Christopher Alexander on patterns. And he said, well, let's get all these guys together, these object-oriented guys. Because you know, I, I, was, I was kind of like the C++ design guy mm -hmm. back then. 
And let's talk about going beyond objects and these isolated things to patterns of interaction between objects. Right. And let's, let's launch this thing called the pattern community. And so we did that. And so I sat down and I wrote my first pattern at that workshop. But at that time, I had started doing organizational analyses. And I, I wrote a pattern that was actually called Buffalo Mountain, which probably wins the prize for the worst name pattern in history. <laughs> Um, sounds pretty good. Any, anything with the word buffalo in it sounds good to me. Okay, that's yeah, Buffalo Burgers, Buffalo Mountain. Yeah. And, um, and then, we, I mean, we had started doing this ethnographic research on organizations, gathering real data from real organizations and putting it together to make some models. And I thought, oh, I can, I can talk about these models using these things called patterns. Now, the reason for the research is we in research have been approached by the people in development saying, all right, we, we have to market in Europe. We have this joint venture with um, Philips Communications called APT, and we need to get ISO 9000 certification. So we need to be ISO 9000 compliant. They're looking for researchers help in doing process stuff. So what can we do to help them? And so I went in and I had a look at the whole ISO thing, and the whole thing is total bullshit. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just total crap. It, it's along with all the other things that the, the British have done in unfolding their empire around the world, ISO 9000 rates up there with, with some of the greatest damage they've ever done. <laughs> I, uh, I can't believe that you've just equated ISO to British imperialism. <laughs> isn't it obvious? It came out of the UK. <laughs> I love it. That's really, that's, that's terrific. So, well, so I went into these organizations and we made some empirical models of what the organizations were doing and we compared them to the, the online methodology, the OLM, which was the official guide for what, what, what AT&T was doing. Yep. No correlation. Yeah. Now, I was never allowed to publish that, obviously. Yeah. Right? The ISO Apple card. But I thought, all right, if processes are not the, the hallmark of what an organization should be looking at, what is it? What is it that an organization should be looking at? And so we thought it's probably in the, in the organizational structure. It's in the roles. And we started making these role-based process models. And um, in the end, what I unwittingly did is I reinvented a branch of sociology called social network theory. Um, mm -hmm. One of the casualties of my career is I'm always discovering that, that someone has ripped off my ideas <laughs> and, um, and stolen them 30 years before I was born. <laughs> and uh, it's funny and this was happens. another one. Social network theory and all the things we had pioneered were invented by a guy named Moreno in mm. 1934. And we had kind of reinvented this as a way of studying organizations. And then we started working with more and more organizations to study them and make these social network models and understand how they worked um, and capturing them as patterns. And one of the organizations I studied indeed was Borland Quattro Pro for Windows. Mm. The way that happened is that David Intersimone, by the way, who's still at whatever Borland is called today, uh, that part of Borland is no longer called Borland, I don't remember what the name is, but he's, he's somewhere in San Francisco, David is, is still there. Wow. And um, he That's said, hey, you know, we'd like you to speak at our conference on C++. And, you know, we'll pay you a lot of money. Well, it's a conflict of interest for me to take money for engagements working in Bell Labs. So I said, tell you what, instead of you paying me, why don't you give me the opportunity to interview one of your teams that supports my research? He said, okay. So he put me together with the, uh, the Quattro Pro team. Mm, and I mean, I had just never seen anything like it in my life. Yeah, you know, I was about my to say job just dropped. Huh? When I read that article, I was just amazed. I mean, I would have loved to have worked with a team like that myself, and I can just imagine how exciting that would have been for you to, to actually see the team and how they work. Yeah. So, of course, I went back to Bell Labs, and I published the information internally, and I said, guys, you know, we don't need all this heavyweight methodology yeah. crap. Yeah. Look, here, here's a company that they rock, <laughs> and they're doing with four people what we're doing with hundreds. I mean, guys, you know. Yeah. This is what the future is going to be like. And then ultimately that was published in Dr. Dobbs' journal. And um, that's the article everyone knows about. But, but there was a draft circulating on the web. And this was, this was, and I've actually gone back and looked at the exact dates because the exact dates are historically interesting. 
because in parallel, there was this guy named Jeff Sutherland yep. who was working on his stuff at the time, which would eventually be called Scrum. Mm. And I think it was in 92 when they, they had run this first Scrum Sprint. And then Jeff came across my article. And after reading the article, introduced daily stand-ups and Scrum Masters into Scrum. Before that, there were no daily stand-ups and there were no Scrum Masters. Oh, interesting. Now, let's make things even more interesting. Do you know where I learned this definitively? So, I mean, Jeff has, has of course, talked about this, but the mm. dates have been a little fuzzy. I was in Japan in January and at a keynote given by Nonaka-sensei. Oh, very interesting. And he had a slide up there with a timeline of Scrum. Yep. And here's his initial work. And here's the patterns from Jim Copleen. And here's <laughs> Jeff's second sprint with daily stand-ups and Scrum Masters. And here's the next thing that Nanaka-sensei did and, and so forth. So Nanaka-sensei sees the patterns is kind of being the historic link from his work into Scrum. And of course, right. Jeff does too for some elements of Scrum. Yeah. And as I said yeah. earlier, there's, there's much deeper foundations for the core of Scrum that go back into to Jeff's personal experience. And, um, but interestingly enough, also go back into Eastern culture. Yeah. And that, of course, is another touchstone. One of the things that, that Jeff and I have in common is that we see very, very strong metaphors in, uh, in Japanese culture and ultimately in, in classic Chinese and Indian culture for the things that we see in Scrum. And they'll sometimes rub up against Western mores. And I think a lot of the struggle we have with getting people to understand the really, really deep parts of Scrum fall along those lines. Um, but I had already gotten some encouragement in that direction from my office mate, a guy named Tom Burroughs, who was a very, ideologically, a very Buddhist guy. He had you know, done a lot of reading. It all made sense to him. And it's, it's how he conducted his life. So, I mean, he wasn't... Um, he didn't go to temples. He didn't dress funny or anything. It was just a school of psychology to him and a good world model. And mm. he had a big influence on me in terms of how those world models affect the way we think about the world of, of work around us. And then um, I carried on the patterns work, started working with Neil Harrison. The, uh, the book would be published in, when was it? 2001, the Organizational Patterns book. Yep. And I didn't, I didn't meet Jeff until, oh gosh, about 2005, 2006. I'd have to, to go back and look. It was the first time that I uh, met Jeff when he was teaching a, a Scrum Master class here in Denmark. And I attended his Scrum Master class. Oh, interesting. So even though um, your patents work influenced the daily stand-up way back in, what, 1992, 93 time period? Some, sometime back then, yeah. You didn't actually meet him until 2006. Wow, Something. another 15 years. Yeah. yeah, it was a long time. Yeah, Scrum's getting old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. That, that's quite amazing. I because I'd, I'd always thought that you were uh, an intimate part of that whole community of people. Um, so no, that's that's a bit I, of a surprise to me. I mean, Jeff tried to get me into the community early on. I mean, he and Jens used to go and some other people saying, come yeah. be a scrum trainer, come be a scrum trainer. Yeah. Um, but I was a little bit concerned about the the um, the kind of Amway nature of it and um, the financial model behind it. And I'm just, I'm not a believer in certification anyhow. Yeah. And certainly not a believer in certification as a way of making the kind of money those guys are making. So... I wanted to not taint myself with, with that, with the trappings of that community. Eventually, I gave in because I thought, well, I can do, I can do more damage on the inside than I can do from the outside. Yeah. So if I get into the community, I have a better chance of of getting them back on on track than I can by throwing stones from the outside. So so I I drank the Kool Aid. It's interesting you said that because um, uh, Ron Jeffries used essentially the same words when I talked to him about um, how he came to the uh, you know Scrum Alliance. And he, he said essentially the same thing, that he can do more damage from the inside than from the outside. Uh, so it's in interesting that you should say that as well. Yeah. Ron has other agendas. Um, he and I argue yeah. a lot and see things a lot differently, but I have immense respect for him. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, do you know that I don't think he offers certification in any of his training? Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. He I, does I the training. 
And training has value, but he says, no, this isn't about certification. I'm not going to offer certification. And I mean, for him to do that, you know, is it takes some guts because yeah. most people yeah. clamor for these scrum courses because they'll give me the piece of paper. That's right. And, yeah. and, and he just said, booga, booga, screw that. <laughs> so <laughs> He's a brave man, actually, he, in many ways. I mean, he, he speaks his mind and, and he stands by it. And I think that's quite admirable. One of the things, again, that we have in common, uh, we kind of have nothing to lose. We've made our names. We've made our reputations. Uh, we're both retired. Yep. Um, and so, you know, what are they going to do to us? You know, fire us? I mean, <laughs> come on. Good point. So um, we, we can afford to speak our minds. Yeah. Um, so let's continue on with the story. Um, to recap, you've been doing quite a lot of patterns work. A lot of organizational patterns work. You went into Borland, saw how they work, um, and uh, uh, published that paper. The um, uh, I can't remember yeah. the name of the paper, but the Quattro Pro paper about Borland. Yeah, the Quattro Pro paper that was picked up by uh, Jeff. Jeff read that, and of course that influenced Scrum. Um, what happened after that? What happened between? Um, uh, roughly about 94 and 2006. Well, that's when Neil Harrison and I were working on the Organizational Patterns book right. um, that, that was later published. Right. And Were you still at I, Bell Labs at this time? Yeah, I was at Bell Labs until about, uh, I don't know, it was maybe 2000. When did I leave there? 2000 or 2001. And, and Bell Labs had just ceased to be you know the the great place that I had come to love over the the preceding twenty years. Yeah, and uh, things were really starting to fall apart. And um, I got a bad manager, and she started doing some stupid things. And her boss was was doing even more stupid things. I thought, yeah, it's it's time to get out. Yeah. But um, so actually, the organizational patterns book came out near the uh, the end of that. So I think it actually probably came out after I left Bell Labs. Mm. But the research was done in Bell Labs and the early research on that had the very strong support of, of managers, some great managers like uh, Eric Sumner Jr. Mm. Uh, he's still floating around somewhere out in uh, New York and New Jersey. Um, Eric was a great manager. You know, he'd come in and tell us what to do, and we'd tell him, you're, 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 you're full of crap, Eric. I'm going this direction. And he said, okay, well, I'll let you go that direction, but you take your own consequences. And um, we did something different than what he said nine out of ten times. And uh, for most of those nine out of ten times, each one of those things turned into something fairly fundamental and great. I mean, Steve Zykes works on visualization, his landmark. He actually spun off a company from the department. Yeah. Um, oh, um, Ken Rehor um, went off working on this stupid thing, which today is called Voice uh, XML. Mm. So Voice XML came out of our department. That was Ken Rehor and Chris Ramming. So all these things that, that our boss thought was stupid, but he let survive. Um, <laughs> he had the wisdom to leave them survive, and he's very proud of that. Yeah. The, uh, mm. the organizational patterns were one of them. So we spent about 10 years refining that book, refining the hell out of that book. Wow. Now, I mean, I was doing some other things on the side, too. Um, there was, you know, some more architecture work that was starting to happen and uh, a few other things. But, I mean, that's, that's kind of the great thing that survived from those 10 years of work. Cool. To my great shame, I haven't read the book. I'm going to well, get a copy. It's... It's kind of not a book that you sit down and read. It's um, it's one that you skim and that you use as a reference. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, people who've gotten the book have really, really enjoyed it. So I'm going to, have to try and dig out a copy. Cool. And then, how did um, how did you eventually end up in the Scrum community? What was it that sort of um, uh, that took you from uh, 2000 to 2006? Well, I moved to Denmark in about, uh, and I kind of moved gradually, so it's hard to say whether it was, you know, 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, got a job at a great little consulting company here called Nordea, mm. and um, 
great culture. So, one of the best Java programmers in the world worked there. Great guy. Um, pretty good. Uh, pretty good management. And um, I was doing a lot of consulting from there, and that's where Jeff came in. He offered the course right. at Nordea. Right. Okay. And yep, yep. We certified the entire company. Um, I eventually outgrew the company, and one day with fear and trembling, I went to the boss and said, you know, I'm going to quit and go out on my own, and he sat back in his chair and laughed out loud, and he says, well, we've, we've been waiting for you to come and say this, you know, it's about time. <laughs> um, and they're, they're still around. Um, the, the consulting part has been absorbed by, um, by another company, but the, uh, the guys from Nordea are still doing set-top box software, and it's a great bunch of folks, but yeah, I got into that course, got my... My my uh, certified Scrum Master certification. <laughs> and, uh, and did you feel special afterwards? Actually, I did a little bit. <laughs> I did a little bit. It's you know, I was a little bit proud of that. It was kind of okay. And because I mean, Denmark is is like Scrum Central. Culturally, it's the place in the world you want to be if you're running Scrum. The level of trust here is high. It's a very flat society. Uh, a lot of small companies rather than or a lot like Sweden except Sweden has big companies yeah and so so Jeff Sutherland was like through here you know every other week teaching a course and Jens Ustergaard who was running he ran one of the first scrums here in Denmark and became a very prolific scrum trainer yeah. so they became kind of part of my social circle and we started uh, hanging out see. a lot with them and talking about scrum and celebrating our common history going back into the organizational patterns Jens bought a uh, a uh, an Udegård, an Udegård, an old um, country estate. Oh, really? Out, uh, in Skåne, or right on the Skåne Blekinge border in mm. southern Sweden. Um, so I mean, it's this mansion with you know fourteen rooms or twenty rooms or whatever, and and he'd gather people together there. <laughs> You know, people like Alistair Coburn and myself and Boris Gloger and Jeff Sutherland and Jens Ustergaard and uh, I think Mary Poppendick, Diana Larson. And then we just come together there and hang out for three or four days. Wow, sounds great. And, and so Jens was instrumental in kind of building this community. And that got me more and more interested or more, uh, let me say, more engaged yeah. in the... Uh, in the scrum milieu and in that community. I started doing some co-trainings, you know, some with, with Jens, some with uh, Jeff. Yep. And uh, like I say, eventually at some point, you know, drank the Kool-Aid and decided to become a scrum trainer. Cool, cool. Just out of curiosity, you're not Danish. Uh, you, you're not from, um, uh, your heritage isn't Danish, is it? Or are you American no. or you? I was, I was born in the U.S. Okay. Yeah, the Midwest. So I've well, always, I'm, I've always sort of uh, associated you with Denmark, but um, you know you're obviously well, that's good. Keep that. Keep that. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's good to be from a civilized country. Yes. <laughs> so I, I was just curious because I mean you obviously don't sound um, like you have an accent. You just and I just couldn't when I started speaking to you. I just couldn't put the two and two together. So that uh, explains yeah. it. Mm. So, so you moved to Denmark after uh, what? After Bell Labs in two thousand, two thousand two ish. Well, I mean, there was another job in between time. I got a uh, job doing hardware work, um, uh, electronic design automation work in in Boston, and I was there for uh, a couple of years. Yeah. But at the end of that, I was actually commuting uh, three weeks, three weeks in uh, Framingham, three weeks in Denmark. Yep. Um, but yeah, I kind of and, and after leaving Bell Labs, oh, there's quite quite a bit that happened after Bell Labs. I actually <laughs> had a, a a job for two years as a university professor at oh, yeah. uh, at North at North Central College, which is a small liberal arts college in the uh, Chicago suburbs. And then did some consulting, and I was at this EDA firm. So it was actually quite a while between yeah. leaving Bell Labs and coming to Denmark. Yeah, about four years, five years, something like that. Yeah, cool. But you've obviously made the transition because it sounds like you're uh, uh, you're permanently there now. Oh yeah, I'm, um, the next time they move me, it'll have to be in a pine box. It's, uh, <laughs> this is it's it's a great country, and um, I mean it's great people just on the the personal interaction level, but also like I say, um, 
if, if you want to be doing software development right, the cultural roots are here in Denmark. The, the Poppendicks, Mary Poppendick gives this talk. Um, there's a book, I can't remember the name, that, that dissects cultures along several important lines. And she's aligned some of these cultural trappings with things that are important to Agile. Mm. And, and looked at the correlation between these cultural trappings, what you find in different cultures. And basically, if you want to be doing Scrum, you want to be in Denmark. Yeah. Mm. Denmark, Sweden, or Finland. Mm. The, <clears throat> the high order bit, and I don't know if Mary talks about this, but one of the things that, that my wife and I have invested a lot in is looking at trust. Mm. And you can measure trust in culture, you know, through some survey questions and looking at how people ask. And I mean, there's nowhere in the world like Denmark when it comes to trust. Uh, the Netherlands is very high. In general, the Nordic countries are very high. Yeah. You don't want to be in Brazil. You don't <laughs> want to be in Mongolia. You don't want to be in Central Africa. <laughs> and frankly, the United <laughs> States is kind of just in the upper middle. And then there's places like, like Turkey in the Middle East, which you know, are often pointed to as having a good adaptive spirit. They're very agile, but there's something missing in the personal relationship level in terms of this trust thing. Now, like mm -hmm. I say, in terms of the corruption index, which I just again looked at yesterday, and that's a very strong contrarian indicator to trust. Uh, Australia and New Zealand also rate very, very high. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, when I'm looking to to open markets, I go in with a, you know, with an open eye. And it's either to, let's try building on the trust that's here or if I'll go into a market where there isn't that level of trust, let's help the market see that that's the issue they need to deal with and emphasize more the personal development side rather than the, you know, here's here's the scrum framework side. That's um that could be a heck of a lot of work. Um, because um, yep. instilling trust is something that takes time. I mean, that's not something that's easy or trivial to do. Uh, and I can see that being very, very difficult. Well, there's a, there's a difference between being difficult and taking time. True. And people equate the two. And I focus more on the this takes time. Yeah. <clears throat> than it being difficult. There, there's very, very few things that are intrinsically difficult. Most things that are difficult are, are in ourselves. You know, we, we haven't done it so it can't be done. Yeah. And we limit ourselves in that regard. There's very, very few things that are intrinsically difficult. I mean, there's some things, if you try to violate the laws of physics, you're going to get in problem. <laughs> um, if you try to lift something that's beyond your strength, you're going to get in trouble. Mm. But um, I mean, this is all about doing the impossible. <laughs> now, and, and you laugh a little bit, but if well, you look at Toyota, true. <laughs> if you look at Toyota, which is where Scrum takes a lot of its inspiration, I mean, and Jeff is very open about this. The new CEO of Toyota set impossible goals for the country, for the company. Yeah, hmm. he said, "We're going to make a car. It's impossible for the car to get into an accident. It's impossible for the car to to injure a human being." We're going to create a car that can go all the way across the United States on a single tank of gas. So he comes in and he sets impossible goals. Mm. And that's what it's all about. Because once you set those goals, yeah. um, even, if you don't, even if you don't meet them, it doesn't mean you failed. But the more exciting stuff is if you look through history. I'm really big again on history. Mm -hmm. And if you study, there's a wonderful anthropologist who's inspired me a lot. If you look at the organizational patterns, they were inspired in large part by an anthropologist named Kraber. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called Patterns of Culture that I think was first published in the 1920s. And some of the manuscripts even go back to near to the beginning of the century. And it is organizational patterns. It is. Um, so this notion of patterns and of using them for culture is, is very, very, very old. But one of the things he looks at in culture is, is um, diffusion theory or idea dissemination. Right. Yep. And he looks at the history of key inventions, and he's got like a hundred inventions in there, and saying, well, you know, we all know Faraday invented this or that Curie invented this. And for every one of them, he can find a co-invention, usually further than 100 kilometers away 
and most often within a month, and almost always within two years. Interesting. For hundreds of inventions. Yeah. Individuals don't invent. Society invents. Absolutely, yeah. And these things show up in individuals. Yep. So. Yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd actually heard that before. So I've heard of that word before. I didn't realize who it was by. Um, but I did realize that a lot of inventions, even though we may attribute them to an individual, are really um, uh, part of that period. They, they evolve from uh, part of the culture and the things that people were talking about during that period and time frame. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think probably a, a similar one is the, uh, the invention of... Um, the internal combustion engine and uh, flight as well. I know that the Wright brothers weren't really the first to um, uh, to fly. Uh, they were the first to have mechanical flight, but they weren't the first to fly. There were other people well, flying before them. Even even being the first to mechanical flight is contentious, and I think the the yes. French are trying to make beach beachheads on that. But yeah, yeah, it's all these things. They're just they're a product of the era. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The things that people are experimenting with at at the time frame and, and the environment that they're in. Hmm. So, but how do we get into invention? Why are we here? I've got no idea, <laughs> but it's interesting all the same. Uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, let me ask you this: um, You've sort of talked us through how you came through, and uh, you know, from your work uh, with patents at AT and T, right through <laughs> to. Uh, how you sort of got involved with the Scrum community and then became, uh, uh, you know, part of the Scrum Alliance. Um, what are you doing now? What are the things that you're working on now that interest you? Uh, I know that you're involved in quite a lot of the, the Scrum Plop stuff, um, but um, would you like to talk about that? What are the things that are fascinating to you at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I'm working with clients to try to uh, to drag them kicking and screaming into better worlds of work. Mm. And I just had a... Uh, had a parting with a client where uh, it's clear they don't have the uh, the will and management to do it. I yeah. mean that's and that that's what I you know that's what I'd like to be on my my headstone right is uh, <laughs> parting of ways. These, well, in fact, maybe you know I think these things succeed if if the change agent isn't visible. That you know you get people to think it's their own idea. But I mean mm. that's that's yeah. what I'd like to do. Yeah. Um, there's another thing is taking a lot of my energy and time. Uh, it's a very small thing, and then we have a Scrum game called Scrum Nosy. And it runs on the runs on the iPad, and you can get on there and uh, and play this game where you challenge your Scrum knowledge against uh, me or Jeff Sutherland, or and uh, and so we're we're evolving that game. That's a lot of fun. I've got that. But yeah, I mean, the Scrum pop, the Scrum plop thing is probably <clears throat> the the biggest thing. The most, the biggest mindshare thing I'm doing in terms of Scrum, mm. and I founded that several years ago from from several perspectives. One is is that the pattern community had kind of lost its way. <clears throat> and that when we founded the pattern community way back on that mountaintop in Colorado, <clears throat> we had a great vision and great ideas about building a body of literature, I mean literature, stuff that's beautiful and that enables groups to come together to build a body of literature for for looking at quality of life and with a real focus on people and quality of the world. We all shared that vision, all seven of us there. It sounds like a utopia. Um, oh yes, it's, it's all inspired by Alexander's kind of utopian vision. And I mean, you know, how do you get to utopia? Well, you know, how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? Absolutely. Yeah. And and maybe you never get there, but it's okay. You know, the journey is what's important. Mm -hmm. um, but the point of view was to be focused outward on human beings and about quality of life and this thing that we call the quality without a name. Mm -hmm. um, the current pattern community doesn't get that. It's become a, I mean, in terms of being a community, they're a great community. They, they support each other well. There's a lot of warmth and mutual support. Um, and so it's kind of a big, you know, 1960s love-in if you go to a plop. I mean, the, <laughs> the culture is wonderful, but I mean, they're, they're just not producing anything. Um, yeah. I, technically, every once in a while, a, a book will pop out or something, but it's probably... 
I don't know if I go so far to say is it's some of the worst literature that's coming out of the technical arena, but it's close because it it kind of doesn't have the rigor of of peer reviewed academic stuff. Right. Because early on we kind of pushed away the academic value system, so we lost that rigor. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't aspire to these great human notions of of emergence and of of morpholo morphological wholeness in the world. So hmm. the pattern community has lost that. So I thought, all right. <clears throat> Let's try again. So let's build a community off to the side. And, you know, we have kind of the blessing, for what it's worth, of the Hillside Group, which is the kind of the, the group that is the glue between all the patterns conferences. Um, and kind of the blessing, for what it's worth, of the Scrum Alliance saying, yeah, you guys often do this. Um, and at one time, you know, we aspired to making this the new Scrum standard <laughs> because mm -hmm. the the Scrum Guide is a standard as far as the rules of the game go. Okay, yeah. so if you want the rule book on how to play chess, you get a book on the game rules for chess. And that's what the Scrum Guide is. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. More <laughs> or less fun. It's got some problems, too. But we're working on those. So what we wanted is a rationalized description of Scrum. Why do we do this? How do you make this work in a certain context? So it's not just a blind set of rules. It's, mm -hmm. you know... Here's the history, the rationale, and thinking of this as a system rather than just individual techniques or individual meetings. Um, as an example of what I mean by this, if you say process improvement, so if I say process improvement to you, you're a scrum guy, what's the thing that comes to mind as a scrum guy? Uh, inspect and adapt would be the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, I like that. And now you're going to go back and do process improvement with your Scrum and your organization. So how do you do that? <laughs> See, most people will think, oh, the retrospective. Okay, that's where I put the process improvement part, right? Mm. And that's just wrong. Mm. <laughs> I mean, Scrum is a process improvement. It's not that it's got this thing in it called process improvement, which is called the retrospective. But that's how a lot of people are thinking about it. Right, yeah. And how a lot of Scrum trainers teach it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's endemic. It's endemic throughout the whole thing. Exactly. And we're yeah. trying to move this next level up. Um, so we put together this... Um, uh, actually, the way it started was one of these meetings at Stora Nudaboda, Jens Sustergaard's uh, big house in the middle of uh, the Swedish countryside, where there were a bunch of us together, and we started talking about patterns. And uh, Gabriella Benefield was there, and... Yeah. And Jeff and Jens and uh, I don't remember who else all was there, but they got excited about this concept of patterns, and we said, "Well, let's get together and do this again, and actually write some patterns." Mm. And uh, and that's how Scrum Plop was born. Ah, interesting. And now it's become a little more institutionalized, so it's kind of the same time, same place every year. It's yep. um it's up here in Denmark at a uh, there are these old. Um, Bath Hotel, the um, beach hotels. Mm -hmm. There's only, I think, four or five of them left in Denmark that go back to the turn of the century. That, that's between 19th and 20th century, that, yep. that turn of the century. Yep. 1800s to 1900s. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Where the wealthy people would come and, you know, spend a summer or a summer week or something. So, and it's out of the way. It's a beautiful on the roans and, you know, there's... Between yeah, ten and twenty of us who've been getting together four times now and having a very, very disciplined writing of these patterns, refining the patterns, making sure they link together in pattern languages, making sure they're empirically backed. So part of it is restoring the pattern vision of being focused on systems thinking and on beauty and wholeness and quality of life. Mm. The other part is to is to go into the foundations of Scrum. Now, we have Jeff Sutherland there mm -hmm. every year. So, you know, we've got the Oracle who can, who can lead us by the hand through some of the history and some of the rationales about why things are the way they are. Um, and there's some really, really simple things. I mean, what, what's the purpose of the daily stand-up? Are you asking me, or is that a rhetorical Yeah, what question? would you say? You know, if I asked you, what's the purpose of the daily stand-up? <clears throat> to communicate. To um, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to 
to describe it without the, using the word talk, but really that's what it is, to talk and communicate. It's to replan. To replan, yeah. What yeah. it is, what it is, it's kind of it's kind of a sprint planning meeting in the small. Yeah. yeah. And so what you do, the reason this is put together is it's like the Borland people did, right? Is we're going to replan every day. Don't and the team is going, going to replan replan its direction to to optimize the chances that they're going to meet their their sprint commitment right and, you know, and Jeff tells us these kind of things and everyone has kind of the same answer that you do well it's good to get around and make things visible and chat but there really is a focused objective and mm. reason for doing this which is okay we're gonna replan the sprint every day interesting yeah yeah That's yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, there's just these little insights that most scrum people don't know yeah. I can see it now. It, it's funny that you should say that because you know now that you you said it, it's um, I can see that actually being the case. Yeah. Interesting. And so these things are. It, there's a term we use in the pattern community, which is obvious. <laughs> 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 of course, it's obvious. Yeah, yeah. But it's not what you said. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes, and so and that's that's exactly what these patterns are trying yes, to do. Yes, and it's a very subtle mind shift. It's not a. It's uh, it's right there. It's just a. Um, uh, it quite difficult to describe actually what went through my mind when I just had that experience. It's, it's actually quite interesting. It's obviously there, but there's a subtle mind shift in perception. <laughs> Sorry, I have a dog here. I didn't like something you said. Teddy, Teddy, stop away. Teddy, Teddy, tooth. <laughs> what kind of dog? Uh, it's a Shetland sheep dog. Oh, very nice. It's ah, uh, the postman is here. He can hear the canal outside. Oh, yep, 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 yep. That'll be what yeah. it is. It's kind of a plowhoon. He, we have him part time. He. Uh, he belongs to a doctor, and the doctor is on vacation right now. Or when the doctor travels to be with patients, um, we take care of him. But well, he's with us this month. Cool. <laughs> uh, before we were so rudely interrupted, where were we? We were talking about uh, the patterns. How you were describing how some of the patterns were trying to restore some of the original thoughts behind Scrum and some of it. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'll bet the people who are watching this interview are going to go through the same mental gymnastics that you just went through. Yeah. When when we come to this point in the interview. Now, what we're doing at Scrumplop is we do that ourselves. Right. So as a group, we go through these gymnastics and then we reflect. Yeah. And say, uh, and I have to say reflect because your colleague down there in Australia, Lachman Haseman, who's, uh, who's <laughs> one of us, says, teams do not introspect, individuals introspect, teams reflect. Okay, Lachlan. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but he has a degree in counseling psychology, so I'll take That's his right. word for it. Yeah, he's a good um, man. I like Lachlan. <laughs> he's uh, yeah, just <clears throat> in the middle of sending him a long mail. Um, <laughs> so we get together and reflect on that and say, okay, what did we just learn? All right, now how do we get other people to come to the realization that we've come to? So it's kind of, and I hate to use this metaphor because it's a sucky metaphor, but you know the rock opera Tommy? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, and so, you know... It's kind of this Tommy experience, you know, how do we give the masses the same experience that we've been through, either by practicing this stuff or from the perspective of collective deep knowledge in history, find a real nugget worth capturing. How do we get you there so you feel you discovered it and that you own it? Yeah. And so mm. we're building this body of literature. We're in our fourth incarnation. There, there's people really, really eager to get this out. Um, <gasps> It's already um, out there, though, isn't it? It's on the web. It's it's on the web, but um, <laughs> there's one of our group who wants to he wants to make everything into an app. Okay, I want to make an app out of this. You know? <laughs> there's an app for that, I'm sure. And I mean, there's other people who want it to be out as a book. I mean, I want it to be out as a book, but um, there's something you mentioned before. I can't remember what it is now, but I'm patient, and so yes. if. If I'm going to go in and change the culture of a country, I'm patient. You know, I'm, I'm willing to wait the 10 years. When Alexander wrote his first pattern book, he took 10 or 20 years. When mm. Neil and I wrote the organizational patterns book, that took 10 years. Mm. No one takes 10 years to write a book anymore. Yeah. 
But that's what it takes to write archival literature, and people just don't understand this. So, you know, I don't want to have any wine before it's time. When it's ready, it will be ready, but there is pressure now yeah. to get it out there. And I suspect that the pressure is 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 going to eventually we'll have to give in, and probably within the next two or three years, we're we're probably going to at least start to assemble this thing into something that looks like a book. Cool. That sounds pretty exciting, actually. It's pretty yeah. cool. But, but as you say, they're on the web at scrumplop.org, and so they're yeah. out there. They're accessible now. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the final question that I've been asking people um, is, uh, where do you see Scrum going? What is your vision for um, what Scrum is going to be in 10 years, 20 years, maybe even further out? Well, hmm. Pure speculation, I just have to course. answer this question in another interview, curiously enough. Oh, really? And I hate this kind of question. What's the future of Agile? What's the future of Scrum? <laughs> I actually sat down and thought about it in a disciplined way. And uh, I don't, you may not like my answer. I mean, Scrum is just a word, and it's not in the yeah. public domain. And, um, <laughs> you know, we like to joke. Um, some of the more mature trainers. The, the reason the Scrum Alliance was created, or one of the reasons is so that no single large company, you know, like, like a, an IBM or a Rally or anyone else could could run with the company of could run with the concept of Scrum and make it their own and turn into a big company that was the only company to own Scrum. And so we formed the Scrum Alliance so that wouldn't happen. So gee, I'm really glad there's no single big company that feels it owns Scrum. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean the fact that they've done that, and I mean, I just saw a um, <clears throat> a post from a Turkish trainer last night, and he's from Scrum.org. By the way, in the Scrum Plop work, we have, um, I think, four PSTs involved. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. And how many? And I'm, trying, I'm trying to make this non-sectarian. It's not a Scrum Alliance thing. It's a Scrum thing. Excellent. Don't confuse Scrum with the Scrum Alliance. Yep. Don't confuse Scrum with the Scrum Guide. Yep. Scrum is bigger than any of those. What we're looking at is going for the, you know, the, the big picture here. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, I think this, this word called Scrum is going to go more and more in that direction. Uh, Jeff and Ken created Scrum to change the world of work and to help people who have nothing get something. The Scrum Alliance was formed to help people make money off of teaching Scrum. Mm. Now, in terms of, you know, what's in the water and what people do, I mean, what everyone does today is called Scrum. Yeah. We got to call it Scrum. You know, where is that going? And most of the people will equate that with Agile. Uh, this little talk I give where I look at the values of the Toyota production system and mm -hmm. I compare them with the production with the things of Agile. So Agile is about deferring decisions to the last responsible moment. Lean is about pulling decisions forward. Mm. And, you know, I have I have five or six dichotomies like that where mm. Toyota production system, which most people call Lean, is exactly the opposite of Agile. And everyone equates Scrum with Agile, and they're running Scrum as Agile. They've lost the thinking. They've lost the planning. Right. So my aspiration for Scrum is that it start doing, they start doing Scrum in the Toyota production system sense. Right. So in addition to Scrum Plop, where I'm putting a lot of my effort right now is in Japan. Because these guys, they just get it. They just get it. And, and now we can go in and do the refinement. I don't, I, need, I don't need to do that aspect of the culture change there. Mm. Um. So first, the first step would be, you know, doing Scrum as Jeff envisioned it, rooted in these practices of the Toyota production system. Because too many people are doing this Agile stuff and the XP kinds of things. And they see it as practices. That isn't what Scrum is. Hmm. It's a way of life. It's like, I do Aikido. Jeff does Aikido. And people think, well, Aikido is something you do if you're attacked in an alley. No, Aikido is a way of life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a daily and Scrum practice. Is the same way. Yeah. So that would be my first aspiration. The, the second aspiration is that we get beyond that to swarm development. So I'm a big fan of open source. To swarm development, did you say? Yeah, swarm development. 
So there's swarm development going on not only in software right now. Do you know about the swarm development, the uh, the open uh, the open source using um, these new 3D printers to make a 3D printed oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. planetary rocket? Yeah, it's yeah. an open source project. Yeah, it's this pretty is cool, pretty isn't it? Cool. Yeah, yeah. There's some amazing stuff happening with the uh, the 3D printing community. It's really quite quite incredible. And the open source community. So, you know, yes. I aspire to things that look more like um, Linux, more like Chrome, more like things that are developed in community to go the next step beyond Scrum. Yes. And that's kind of a, you know, a hyper Scrum where you're not limited by individual local teams. Mm. And I think that there's a great paradigm shift between you know, the way we were doing things in what's popularly called waterfall to doing things in scrum and small teams, and then another paradigm shift from there to community development. Mm. So, and it's not scrum, it's another paradigm. Yeah, yeah, it's um, bigger than scrum. And, and my fantasy would be is that a good amount of, of development of complex systems goes in that direction. Now, unfortunately, I get pretty cynical about this, and I'm not optimistic. Um, mm. And we have the great dumbing down of Scrum through the certification agencies, through the books that have been published. Yeah. Um, people don't get this deep stuff down at the level of double loop and triple loop learning. They're, they're running with the practices. They're running with the techniques. Um, I'm pulling my hair out right now in the retrospectives community. I'm part of a, um, a mailing list. And... They have a very carefully defined and very carefully defended fortress in terms of what retrospectives mean. And if you come in with an idea, then you're being upsetting, you're not respecting others' opinions, and you are violating their feeling of safety. <laughs> so these people want to be safe. <clears throat> this is retrospecting is all about getting out of a comfort zone. And these people are defining themselves in terms of we need to feel safe. And so they don't understand, even at the meta level, this, nation, this notion of getting into areas of discomfort to, to evolve. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm not very optimistic because the, there's something in the training and certification communities in particular, or in the consulting communities, it's broader. It has to do with, I'm making money off of an idea yeah. that, that breeds a, a very disconcerting conservatism. That, you know, hey, I could get my ticket punched and make money off of this idea once. Don't you dare muck, muck with my ideas because that takes away things that are important to me at very low levels of the Maslow hierarchy. Hmm. And... Um, so unwittingly, in the name of progress, this has become a community that's very unable and, in fact, unwilling to grow and learn. So this is why I like going into places like Japan that are otherwise virgin markets, Turkey, Nepal. I'm going to Palestine mm. in November. They get it. They get it. Yeah. So I can totally understand where you're coming from. I, I totally understand... Uh, what you're saying and quite honestly I see it all around as well um, the places that I tend to see it tend to be with larger corporates large corporate organizations where there is of course as you said earlier lack of trust um, and I'm not so worried about that because um, uh, the way that I see it is that the large corporates aren't going to survive. It's going to be the small, aggressive companies that are going to push them out of the way. Yeah, I'm totally with you. And it's not the big corporates I'm worried about because exactly of what you say. Yeah. Is that they're going to either. Yeah. Uh, and I think what will happen with them is I don't think it's as black and white. I don't think they will die. I think uh, they will agreed. learn how to yeah. become, how they will learn, they will learn to become many small corporations internally. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. so yeah, I, I'm not worried about them. What I'm worried about is this, this silent majority, this invisible right. ghost. Yes. I mean, there's nothing uglier than watching a bunch of facilitating consultants try to facilitate each other. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been to these coach, coach, coach retreats and retrospectives gatherings, and I mean, you, you will never see more acerbic interactions 
all, I mean, my, my favorite story, th this is all about them having to feel good out of their insecurity and protecting their, their well-being. So when I went to the retrospectives gathering in Bath yeah. uh, three or four years ago, and I was there, and Gabby was there, and Jens was there. What they did is they handed out tokens, appreciation tokens, and they were stickers, and you were given a finite number of them. <laughs> and what you could do is you could give them to people to appreciate people. If you appreciated someone, you could give them a token. Well, of course, some people ended up, you know, the, the big name consultants ended up with all of the tokens because yeah. they're visible. And there are some people who ended up with none. Whereas that community, what they should have been trying to do is support the people who otherwise would have ended up with no tokens. Yeah. So what they've done is they've created a false economy with limited resources. Yeah. And that's how they work in the real world. Oh, dear. Now, there's some things that aggravate that. So the agile people work that way out of insecurity. You're seeing less and less co-training. I mean, the managing director of the Scrum Alliance had to just come out and make a plea for this train the trainer program because trainers are too busy doing things that give them visibility for getting their ticket punched yeah. to make a contribution to the community. Yeah. It's all driven by money. And it's not like these people are going to starve. I mean, these people are making hundreds of thousands of euros a year, some of them. Mm. This is crazy. So it, we, we've created this false economy, and it's created a community of, of sharks. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how to fight that. It's really, yeah. really difficult. The other thing that makes it difficult is they'll hang their hat on some, you know, some real important trappings like, I mean, commitment is non-existent. You try to get commitment from a lot of these folks, and they'll commit to something, and they won't deliver. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, even for Scrum Plop, one person met the deadline. Now, how did we set the deadline? I asked them, when can you guys commit to deliver? <laughs> I did not post the deadline. I did the Scrum thing. Estimate. When are you guys going to deliver? One person made the deadline. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. and they'll say, oh, we're agile. Mm. We get to inspect and adapt. Convenient they don't understand excuse. Commitment. Yeah, yeah, very convenient excuse. Yep. Yeah. And so that's my concern about what will ultimately, I think, discredit Agile. Eventually, there's going to be a backlash, and there's going to be enough people who figure out that that's the game they're playing, and, and they will fall hard. Now, you know, you can't predict what's, what will follow a crash like that. Mm. You simply can't. Um, and I see some people carefully avoiding getting a scrum label or an agile label because of things like this. A guy who I respect a lot is Alistair Coburn. Mm. And, you know, he very carefully avoids labels. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think this is part of it. It's a survival strategy. Um, yeah. So he's very clever and very cunning from a business point of view, but he's honest and adding value. Yeah. And I respect him for that. And, you know, uh, he's... I really, I'm trying to emulate that to, de to the degree I can. Yeah, I have one foot in the Scrum Alliance because there's still hope I can maybe use that foot to kick them in a good direction. But you know, my patience only goes so far. Yeah. And they're great people individually. It's just that a lot of them are insecure. And collectively, the intelligence of any organization uh, is the intelligence of the least intelligent person divided by the number of people in the organization. So... <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, to be honest, I've, I've got a much more optimistic point of view. I, I reckon that um, something will survive regardless of what you call it. It may not be called Scrum in another 10 years. But I think okay. the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole flow, the, um, uh, the Deming cycle, I think that will still go forward. Okay, but I'll buy that. But now let me let me play historian with you. Okay, yeah. I'll He's play doing. that, but I'll say those things will be the same things that survived into Scrum. Absolutely, yes. Ten years ago, which yeah. were the same things that survived into that from the previous generation. Absolutely. And so I'm not optimistic about progress. I'm optimistic about retaining the status quo that we've always retained. And if you want to ascribe some Scrum nomenclature to that, that's your prerogative. Right. One of the things I do in my Scrum training, I love this. I go in and I draw a process. I say, okay, guys, I'm going to draw a process. 
So here's a process where we have six to eight months of deliberation and analysis, maybe as much as five years, and then there's a review. And after the review, you do high-level design, and at the end of the high-level design, there's a review. Then you go into implementation and test, and at the end of that, there's a review, and then you ship. What have I described? So what did you just hear? What have I described? Well, uh, it could be interpreted either way. It could be interpreted <laughs> either as waterfall or it could be interpreted as scrum. It's scrum. Get over it. Yeah. Jeff Sutherland just said at the last scrum plop that there was one client where they did five years of analysis to get to an enabling spec for the PBIs. Five years. Good grief. On the average, I think a good product owner should take six months. Yeah. Analysis is hard. Analysis is a lot of work. Absolutely. I tell people, I want to see 10 product owners for every developer. That's where the payoff is. Really? 10 product owners for every you, developer? I mean, if I say 10, I'll get three. So okay. I say 10. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Right? That's where the payoff is. Mm, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So these are the kind of things that break mindsets. Mm. Right is let's actually, and not in a formal way, but have the whole team together, work with the, with the business to do analysis, get to an enabling spec. But And this is a good idea. And it goes back to the Egyptians building pyramids, for crying out loud. Mm. I mean, there's nothing new in Scrum from the point of view of that principle. Yes. Yeah. But the Agile people want to destroy it and say, oh, we're Agile because they avoid commitment. And these planning up front, they equate with commitment. Mm. And I think it's, again, it's one of these subtle differences. Yeah. And people can't see the subtlety and the difference between planning. You know the phrase, defer, defer decisions to the last responsible moment? Yep. Do you know that comes from lean? Yes. And yep. it, means, it means exactly the opposite of what the agilists tell you it means? So, so what... What does it mean? So let's be clear. What, what are the differences? So what deferring decisions to the last responsible moment means, where, the, where, the, where, where it comes from, is if you defer a decision, decisions depend on each other. Yep. If you defer a decision, if you defer making the decision, the decision may be made for you because history still marches on. Yeah. And at some point, other decisions will box you in and take away your options in being able to make that decision. Yeah. Therefore, the responsible moment comes very early. And what you should do is line up the dependencies between your decisions in something called a decision structure matrix, a DSM, where you look at the dependencies between your decisions and pull as many of the decisions forward as you have the power to make now. It's about pulling decisions forward, not about pushing them off. Now, that's interesting. You find, the, you find the last responsible moment and you make decisions up to what the last responsible moment is now. Right. That's, there's this great essay by a guy named Ballard yeah. in the lean, Ballard? In the Lean Institute, which is called, uh, it's a paper on something called Negative Iteration. If you Google it on the web, you'll find it. Meditative. And he explains the original sense of this phrase, deferring decisions to the last responsible moment. It's brilliant. Yeah, I'll look that up. See, the, my understanding of, um, of that concept, deferring things until the last responsible moment, uh, must be the, what you're referring to as the agile point of view, which is that uh, you don't make decisions until very late in the process and so you right. can, so you go down sort of a, a sort of a set based design approach where you can try multiple uh, solutions and then you decide on which solution makes sense much further down the track ah but notice what you've done yes set based design is a powerful concept here and it feeds into my definition that does not feed into the common agile definition let me explain why mm, please do. see what you've done okay what the agilists do is they view time as a single line mm -hmm. um i don't know are you into nlp at all there are uh, actually some pretty honorable things in neurolinguistic programming that have to do with how people look at time 
if you look at time being in the timeline with the timeline going through your head or if you look at it from outside, and this is called in time and through time. So the angelists are viewing this as what's called a through time perspective, which mm -hmm. is the, the timeline goes through your head. And I don't have enough knowledge now to make the decision. Therefore, I need to defer the decision to the last responsible moment until I have enough knowledge to make the decision. Yep. Well, that's just stupid. You want to be an in-time person who can stand outside the timeline, slice the timeline into pieces, and do set-based design. So instead of serializing the, the decisions, parallelize them. Right. Do set-based design, right. pull yeah. the decisions forward so that I can make decisions early. That gives me an informed posture from which to make the next decision rather than an uninformed posture that will constrain my ability to make that decision in the long term. Wow, See the difference? Yes, absolutely. That, that's quite a, uh, quite a, a flip. I mean, that's... Um, uh, similar language, but the uh, what you're talking about is actually quite different, even though you're using the same language. So here's here's another time. It's happened three times in our conversation where <laughs> you said, "Oh, it's it's the same, but it's subtle." Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, and the subtleties will kill you. Mm, mm. I can and, see that, especially with this one, because this is a big one. That's a that's a big flip. That's not yep. a trivial flip. That's that's quite a, a large difference in understanding. No, and you see, this is why this is why I've treasured working with Jeff, and why I'm trying to use. In fact, I'm working with Jeff, and also with Ken. I don't know if you know. There's four of us who kind of own the Scrum Guide. It's um, it's Jeff and Ken and two other guys, and I'm one of the two other guys. You and David and, are, is that uh, David Starr? Yourself? Yeah, David Starr, yeah. great guy at Microsoft. Mm. Yep, yep. And. Um, you know, we're trying to get to the bottom of this stuff and say, gosh, how do we get this stuff out to the masses so the masses don't fall into these sound bites that the consultants use to promulgate their careers and their constituencies, right? Because they're feeding on the fantasies of management who want to hear certain things. Mm. Managers don't want to make decisions. Decisions are painful. Oh, <laughs> I can defer decisions to the last responsible moment. That's <laughs> super. <laughs> Okay, a consultant to tell me it's okay to justify my behavior here. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's about discipline. Yeah. And the agile people too often are missing the discipline. And they yeah. think, you know, agile is laid back California guitar playing programming. No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because um, my early experiences with Scrum were um, a actually, you, you mentioned earlier about. Um, people wanting to be comfortable. One of the things that I really loved about Scrum was the total sense of exposure that I felt. Um, it, it gave me a bit of a thrill because it was just so raw and so naked. And I really love that. And yep. um, it's very, so, very seldom do I see that nowadays. And when I see it, I still love it. I, I still love that just, you know, that that complete sense of uncomfortable, not knowing what the hell is going on, um, you know, it, it, just on the edge of chaos. It, it feels really, really nice. And yeah. I do and miss people, that. People use these words, but if they go deep, they don't really appreciate what that means. Yeah. And the, to me, the biggest problem here is, you know, call it paradigm or call it culture. I mean, you and I were raised a certain way. We have certain beliefs. We belong to a tribe. You know, mm. what tribe do you belong to? You know, I belong to the C++ tribe. Okay, that was, that's kind of the tribe I was raised in, right? And tribes have tribal beliefs. Yep. And it doesn't matter whether they're true. I believe them. Mm. And that operationally makes them true. And people in American culture collectively have certain beliefs. In Australian culture, slightly different set of beliefs. And these beliefs will, people feed on these beliefs to come to certain conclusions. Now, and now there are consultants who will feed on these beliefs to make a career. Yeah. And most of them are just doing it accidentally out of their own traps and their own tribal beliefs. There are some of them who are doing it consciously and who know better. So one of my favorite examples is Kanban. 
which is really big on this, not only deferring decisions, but we can rearrange things at any time, more or less, right? The manager, it gives the manager the power to rearrange things and to not have to coordinate the work as a team, mm. to be able to manage things on an individual level. And the whole thing is based on this notion of a Kanban, which is um, kind of demand-driven flow, is that if I'm out of a resource, I make a request for more work or more resources and I manage work in progress that way. The problem is, is that if you put a, a work in progress limit on a system, it becomes a push system rather than a pull system. Mm -hmm. People, you know, I talk to people in the Kanban community and they're trying to resolve this paradox and some of them will have some religious statements. There's a really clear-minded um, guy named Chris Matz. Mm -hmm. He gets this. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's kind of the co-inventor of Kanban and he sends broken ranks with the rest of them because he says they, they really don't understand what's going on. If you go into Toyota, which is where this came from, mm -hmm. number one, Taiichi Ono hated Kanban. Interesting. He says, he says, it's a concession to, it's what you do when we can't do things right. <laughs> Doing things right means co-located team work cell. When we can't do things right because the supply is remote, we suck. So yeah. we got to do Kanban. Yeah. Number two, if you do it that way, when Toyota does that, they always plan in advance to tell the supplier when the Kanban card will be coming. Mm. It's not just in time. <clears throat> it is right. planned. Mm. The value stream is planned. And the people who are big on this just in time stuff, well, there's another killer phrase, just in time, <laughs> don't understand the bigger picture. Yeah. So if you read books like Extreme Toyota, this is extremely complex to understand, and the Kanban people trivialize it. Number three, no one using real Kanban in Toyota ever uses a thing called a Kanban board. <laughs> and you look at the whole you know, modern software Kanban thing, and it's based on this notion of a Kanban board. And I started yeah. pointing these things out two or three years ago, and then the, the Kanban community did a backpedal and said, oh, no, ours is not based on the Toyota one. It's something different. And the community is kind of split right now about whether they're they're honoring Taiichi Ono or whether they're just, you know, stealing the term, which is frankly a little embarrassing because it looks a little intellectually dishonest, and of course it is. <laughs> but people so cling to their need to make a living off of concepts that they feel will be accepted by managers and so unwilling to get outside of their comfort zones and change that, uh, you know, we've really institutionalized some bad things. Mm. And I mean, Kanban is one of my favorite whipping boys because it's so easy to deconstruct. <laughs> the others are much more subtle. So some of the subtles we've talked about here. I, yeah. I can talk with people until I'm blue in the faith about, about last responsible moment and they don't get it. Yeah. It's extremely difficult to make that mindset change. So Yeah. It's, it's interesting though. It's, um, it's quite a different point of view. Yeah. Quite interesting. So now you understand why history is important to me. I've done my homework on these things. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let me ask you this. Um, why were you frightened or why do, why do you dislike that question? Because oh, the question that I asked um, at the start of this, um, uh, this thread, which was, uh, where do you see Scrum going? Why do you dislike that question? Because um, personally, I, I've gotten most value out of, you know, the last uh, 20 minutes or so. I, I think that's been a really, really interesting discussion. Right, but that has nothing to do with where Scrum is going. I mean, to me, asking oh, where is Scrum point. going is kind of asking where is Zen going? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a non-question. Yeah. It's not like... Now, there is something profound here. Um, and I think it happens starting on an individual level. You know, one of the people who's influenced me a lot is, is probably obvious is Christopher Alexander. And you know, there's a lot of people who kind of accuse me as being a, a, an Alexander cultist or at least an <laughs> Alexander fanboy. But he also has thought about things very carefully. Um, ah, I can't think of a guy's name right now. There's a... Um, Part of my brain shuts off when I'm when I'm interacting in an interview. Um, uh, Andreas Tomasini, his uh, his uh, byline on his mail is "Agile is not something you do; it's something you are." Yeah, 
Yeah, I've seen that one. Oh, yeah. And I think he's wrong. Really? Why do you say that? It's not something uh, you are. It's something you become. Mm. Angel is about becoming. Yeah. It's not about being. And it's not just about doing. Now, there's elements of all of these. But people don't get this becoming part. So your question about the becoming, I think, is very important. Now, that happens at the individual level to start with and then moves to the collective level. How do we as a team become? Yeah. What are we becoming? Yeah. What are we as an industry becoming? And so one of the blogs I need to write one of these days is that people, people do things for, for basically two reasons. One is, is they're driven forward by a goal and they see a possibility. And the other is that they're running from something. Mm. Right? Yeah. This is so bad that I don't care whatever it is I end up on, the first thing that comes in front of my eyes, I'm going to run at because it can't be any worse than what I'm at. <laughs> and my concern is if you ask a question about how does Scrum evolve, it anchors you in the second worldview. Right, okay. Yeah. It's a what's wrong with what we have today that we have to run from. Mm. What I'd rather do is build on something deep within humans. It's a vision of possibility. Mm. And then get the process of becoming going. Yeah. Rather than the process of doing, which is more in that second paradigm of let's fix Something what we're broken. doing today. Yeah. And and Scrum has this problem. Scrum only fixes things in small chunks. Yeah. There's no place for a paradigm shift in Scrum. Scrum yeah, was right. perfect. Yeah. Scrum was perfect. There was no process for changing the Scrum guide. Hell, there's a process for changing the CMMI. They know they're not perfect. It's a process for evolving it. They're agile. But you can't evolve the definition of scrum. <laughs> so I said, this is bullshit, okay? We need a process for evolving scrum. And that's why David and I have stepped in, and we're kind of the feeders to Jeff and Ken about, okay, guys, you know, scrum yeah. needs to be agile, too. We need to be able to evolve the scrum guide, guys. Yeah. Let's be agile here. <laughs> and so... When I think about the future of Scrum, you know, and this is why I'm saying things like open source is this vision of a community coming together mm. and deciding where we need to go. That's part of what Scrum Plop is about. Yeah. Let's tap into the communities and get the vision. I mean, even Scrum isn't Scrum. Do you know what a Type C Scrum is? Um, I used to. I don't anymore. It's been ages. I mean, since this I've comes read. out of the Takeuchi and Nanaka paper, and yeah. this is the kind of scrum that Jeff was running at Patient Keeper. Yeah. Where they're kind of running, you know, four sprints in parallel. They yeah. can deliver three times a week. And Ken, Ken, Ken came in and looked at it, and Ken first of all said, "That's not scrum, but it's one hell of a competitive monster." Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so is that scrum? I mean, it's what Jeff Sutherland was doing at Patient Keeper. Is it Scrum? Who gives a damn? Yeah, good point. One of the things I've learned working in Japan is a word has a spirit. Mm. And overuse of the word destroys the spirit of the word. So Kaizen nice. used to have a spirit. And we saw we have used it so much. We've destroyed the spirit of the word Kaizen. We've destroyed the spirit of the word Scrum. And people aren't, they don't get the spirit. They get the trappings. They get the ceremonies. Yeah, yeah, the process. Oh, Scrum, uh, this many meetings, this many ceremonies, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. This many artifacts, right? Yeah. No, it's not. That isn't what Scrum is. Yeah. And that's why I say future of Scrum is like future of Zen. Yeah. But what does that mean? It's, it's a worldview. It's a way of life. That's a good analogy, actually. I, I see a lot of similarities between the two. That's not by accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> You've thought about this, haven't you? <laughs> so, um, I've actually got one final question for you. and um, I've been uh, mulling this over since you mentioned it right at the very start of the hour. And that is about um, uh, Scrum and Buddhism. How, and you talked... Um, uh, off camera, off the uh, before the interview began, you talked a little bit about uh, some of Jeff's, Jeff's experiences with uh, meditation um, and how that sort of led to Scrum um, indirectly. Um, but what were your thoughts about how Scrum is like Buddhism, 
What were some of your ideas that you were referring to there? Oh, uh, this is something I thought of more than I can convince you that I thought about it. Mm. Um, I gave a um, for people who want to follow up. There's a um, I gave a talk at uh, what was called the Alexander Fest in uh, Japan about uh, I don't know it's four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And the talk is on YouTube, and it's a fairly long talk, so it's split up into six or seven uh, videos. Uh -huh. But you know, I've been around. I'm older than I look. <laughs> um, I, mean, I wrote my first code. I wrote my first code back in 1969. So uh, oh, wow. I've been around I was a lot. Born in 1969. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you know, I've been through patterns, and you know, if you, I don't know if you've read, read any of the pattern stuff, any of Christopher Alexander's books. But I mean, it re it reads like the Tao Te Ching. You know, what yeah. the Japanese called the Dokyo. Yeah. And the first time I met Alexander face to face in '96, I said, "So you know, Professor Alexander, your stuff sounds a lot like the uh, the Tao Te Ching. You know, is there any correlation there?" And he says, "Well, yeah, of course. Isn't it obvious?" <laughs> <laughs> and so there's those roots there. There's the Oriental roots that Jeff had mm. going for for Scrum. And you know what's on the cover of the organizational patterns book? Which no. is the Terracotta Soldiers. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, my brushes with Buddhism, with my friend Tom Burroughs, and uh, ah, my best sensei ever was a guy named Chris Skelly, yeah. um, who's another one of the early C++ guys. Absolutely brilliant guy. Um, and I could really, really see how this stuff at an extremely deep level modeled, explained to my deepest self why these things worked. Now, mm. the problem is, is that for people like us who converse the way that we do and we're in a Western context, you know, we're part of that tribe, we have a certain background and certain metaphors and images we can draw on, I can't use this medium and this language and these metaphors to tap into that stuff. Right. So I need to go to something deeper. And this gets into stories, experiences, mm. shared experiences, um, lateral ways of thinking. Um, you know, if we, if we could do group meditation, that'd be great, but I haven't, I, I think there are people who do that, but I haven't figured that out yet. Um, <laughs> um, there's something here that's intrinsically inaccessible to the common way that, that humanity has evolved to deal with, with everyday things. And to me, part of Scrum is a return to something extremely visceral, very mm. primordial in social wiring, not in individual wiring. I mean, that too. Mm. Um, Buddhism and its stories, its words, I mean... It isn't that Scrum is Buddhism. Buddhism is just a tool yeah. that helps me access these things. It's like Alexander said, great patterns aren't discovered, they're invented. Mm. They, 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 they appeared at creation. They have always been a part of you, and it's yeah. your upbringing that covers them. And I think a lot of Scrum is the same way. Yeah. Is that, I mean, if you go back and you look at how the, the babies in arms program were working in the... Um, you know, the hacker community at MIT back in the 60s, it had a lot of the trappings of what we call Agile today before we learned how to do methodology. Yeah. When the, the companies got afraid of, of managing these big complex things. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that is, that's my path. Hmm. That's my tool to these very, very deep things in Scrum. Other people will find other paths, you know, for... For Indian subculture, there's unbelievably strong parallels between Vastu Shastra, which is another school of architecture, and and some of the things you find in patterns that you find in Scrum. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, every culture I think is going to have to find its own path, and you know, the result may not always be the same. So Denmark is great for running Scrum out of the box. Yep. What's India Scrum look like? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Where you have a caste system, yeah. and the scrum master is of a different caste than the rest of the team. How do you build on those cultural roots? 
You see, it's easy. Okay, let, let's play the Brits again and cultural relativism and my culture is better than yours. Well, no. I'm not convinced that our Western culture is better than what the Indians have in their caste system. It may be the best culture for their cult, for their society. I yeah. am not in a position to judge. Yeah. <laughs> so what is what does India plop look like? What's China plop look like? You want to find a place that's incompatible with Scrum? Oh yeah, let's go to Beijing, folks. <laughs> Hierarchy, respect culture, tradition. But you know, invariance. there there are some aspects of Chinese culture that are exactly what you've just just described. But um, but and the but is important. Yes, go for it. There are other parts of China which are very different. I mean, there's the North and South divide, and the Northern Chinese are very much like that. But the Southern uh, is quite different. Uh, southern China is very um, uh, almost fly by the seat of your pants culture. Oh, but that's that's a pretty universal cultural pattern, north to south, and it has to do with climate. Really? I mean, yeah. I mean, the Denmarks are the free and easy. We're the Italians of the Nordic countries. <laughs> All right. I mean, you, you want to see people who look more like Chinese? Go to Norway. I mean, go to Finland. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't know. I totally agree with you. Yeah, I've seen that actually. No, yeah. that's a very well-known cultural pattern. Yeah, is that the further toward the equator you go, which in the way the world is set up, it usually means going south. Yeah. Um, the less structured the culture is. So there's something about the the cold, cold winter climate. months that require the need for more structure in culture. You know what? There's, I hadn't there's, there's, I hadn't thought about there's it. There's amazing. But, yeah. There's amazing stuff like this. Yeah. Why does all outsourcing go from west to east? Can you think of a company that outsources to a company to the west of it? Yeah. <laughs> There's something very powerful going on there. This comes out of some anthropological research I did back in Bell Labs. Yeah. It's noted by a guy named Peter Berge, who's a, uh, an anthropologist out of the University of Chicago and has yeah. to do with time zones. There's a, lot of, there's a lot going on here that you're not going to find in the owner's manual. There's a lot going on here you're not going to find in the scrum guide mm. That, mm. that has to do with what makes us intrinsically human. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to tap into. And scrum is kind of my path through the Toyota production system, through Buddhism, to this, uh, what the Japanese call mumu no shitsu. Mm. Which is... This, this, this nameless thing, giving something a name destroys it. Giving something a name destroys the spirit of that word in some small, in some small measure. That's not only the Orientals who understand this. Uh, Voltaire said, uh, La parole était donnée à l'homme pour sa pensée, is that speech was given to mankind that he might better hide his thoughts. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and so words destroy. Yeah. But it's kind of all we got. And that's the paradox. And that's kind of, I mean, you asked, what am I about? What am I up to? I'm up to this. That's what I'm about, is working through that paradox to help the world, help other people get to this deep stuff that's already inside of them. Yes. And a lot of it is just stripping off the crap that they've picked up over the years that prevents them from seeing this wonderful stuff inside of them. Yeah. So when Scrum came along, I said, yeah, I know this stuff. Yeah. There was nothing new in Scrum for me. It feels quite natural. Yeah, natural is a funny word, but yeah, it's again, it's a word. <laughs> <laughs> it's all we've got. <laughs> Yep. Hmm. Cool. Well, I've. Uh, oh my God! Is that the time? <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, fun when you're having fun. Yeah, I was enjoying it as well. I um, I do apologize. I mean, I I really should have kept a closer eye on the time, but I sort of got quite carried away. Oh. Um, I'm on vacation, so I'm enjoying this too. Oh, good on you! Sounds like fun. Um, so I. If you don't have any objections, I think probably now might be a good time to to wrap it up. Um, 
thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the last couple of hours. <laughs> thank you for taking. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we finally got to meet up. It's been a pleasure meeting you too. Absolutely. If I, yeah. uh, if I get down to the other side of the equator, which I'm, I'm not doing so much these days, I'll uh, I'll try to look you up. Oh, please do. Yeah, yeah. Give me a shout if you're uh, passing through, and and um, I'm happy to fly to to wherever. So I, I'd be happy to um, you know make that happen. And that's All a commitment. Right, super. <laughs> that's a commitment. Okay. Yes. Right. So you can. <laughs> Unfortunately, hold I can't commit to coming to the other side of the equator, but uh, <laughs> it's a hope. It's a hope. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. No, so talk. It's, it's been a lot of fun for me too. <laughs>